the Asian uh, century concept is well understood and it's well advanced in reality, that is, there's been an industrial revolution across the Asian economy in the last 20 or 30 years that is well advanced. What is less well understood and what we address in our report is the need for an Asian financial revolution. Asia has got to this point in its economic development with quite a heavily regulated, unsophisticated financial system in many of its emerging economies and that system needs to change. We need to see reforms in order to fulfil the next stage of their development. The implication of this is that the Asian financial system will not only change but grow tremendously on the back of um, a, a build out of their debt and equity markets, um, greater in interaction with the global financial system and of course just the strong rates of underlying economic growth that we're seeing in the system. So right now Asia's financial system is roughly just over half the size of either the US or the European financial system. By 2030, we expect the Asian financial system, if all goes well with reforms and political stability and continued economic growth, that the Asian financial system will be more than double the size of either the US or Europe. And this is going to be a profound shift in the way the global financial system works, akin to the shift we're seeing in the way the global economy works. So as we look at the impact upon the Asian century, Cage Tiger really highlights the fact that the Asian financial system must evolve if Asia is going to achieve what it should achieve and can achieve. And that means that you need to have a strong Asian-based financial system. That means disintermediation has got to start happening. We need to build a local capital markets capability. We need to be converting people's savings into investment. We need to be looking at the amount of pension reform and how the pension reform will continue to drive further business investment. And Asians need to be doing it with Asians. Today, we basically recycle a lot of that money back into London and New York, and then it comes back into Asia. The Asian financial system can do that on its own. The size of the Asian financial system over the next few decades, if all goes well, is, is going to warrant a number of major financial centres in the, in, the, in the region, in the time zone. Uh, Shanghai is obviously front and centre to be the new New York. That is, it'll be a financial centre for a large domestic economy, as well as being an international financing centre. So Shanghai is likely to be the biggest financial centre in the world within 10 years or so, I'd imagine, if this financial reform process is, um, is run to sort of completion. Uh, but beyond that, we're going to see, I think, substantial other financial centres. I think t Tokyo will remain very important, um, as will Seoul, I think will grow as well. And Hong Kong, while it will have a relatively less important role vis-a-vis -vis China, will, I think, remain very important, especially in certain niche markets, whether it be capital raising um, and various other elements of the way the financial system works. Moving down into South Asia, Given that those economies have still got a long way to go before they sort of reach this development point, I think Singapore will remain a hugely important financial centre for Southeast Asia and will continue to grow. So the two big ones in Asia will be Singapore and Shanghai, and then you're going to have your second tier centres such as um, Tokyo, Hong Kong, and I think Sydney will also benefit from the fact that we have a very well developed financial system um, and a very strong economic relationship um, with Asia and an increasingly I think we're going to be funding our economy with capital flows from Asia rather than from America and Europe.